It was Christmas Eve 2019, but the holiday spirit was about to be overshadowed by horrible events in this London neighbourhood. It was 9pm when Alex Bakiri and his wife Deborah returned to their home in Battersea after an evening out. They'd been out to a restaurant in Sloan Square in London for a pleasant meal. They picked up their three-year-old son. He was walking between them, holding both of their hands as they walked back to their home. Alex opened the gate and suddenly a dark figure appeared behind them and started firing. Ten shots were fired. Eight of them hit their mark. I'm Chris Summers. I'm a crime reporter and in this episode we look at a murder in the British capital which had its roots in Scandinavia. When the footage was played in court, it came complete with audio and the gunshots were followed by Deborah's shrieks as she tried to protect her son from witnessing the horror of seeing his father being murdered before his eyes. As Alex lay on the ground, an off-duty nurse rushed to help and soon an air ambulance landed and paramedics desperately tried to save his life. But Alex was declared dead at 9.46pm. But who was Alex Bakiri? He claimed to be a music producer living in London and his, his sister, Missy, uh, was in the uh, reality TV show Real Housewives of Cheshire. So what happened on that Christmas Eve in Battersea and why was Alex Bakiri so brutally murdered? The answers lay hundreds of miles away in Scandinavia. In the early hours of Christmas Day, Alex Bakiri's assassin had flown to Copenhagen. He then crossed the bridge into Sweden and the city of Malmo. It was Malmo that was at the heart of the bloody underworld feud which had claimed the life of 36-year-old Alex Bakiri. There were two feuding groups in Malmo, one led by Amir Meki and the other by Daniel Johansson Petrovsky. They were both involved in smuggling cocaine and other drugs into Sweden on a grand scale. In 2018, Petrovsky's half-brother was kidnapped by Meki's gang, and although he was later released, it was the trigger for what became a spiral of violence. Three members of Meki's gang were gunned down in a cafe in the centre of Malmo in June 2018, and their deaths were soon to be avenged. Bakiri and his close friend Naef Adawi were part of Petrovsky's gang, and they found themselves in the firing line. In August 2019, Naif Hadawi was leaving an apartment in Malmo with his girlfriend and his baby daughter. Two gunmen suddenly appeared. They shot at Hadawi. He ran off, dropping the baby. His girlfriend, Carolina Hakim, was not so lucky. She was shot dead, but Hadawi got away. Adawi fled to London and was with Bakiri a few hours before he was shot on Christmas Eve. In fact, after Alex's murder, Deborah rang Adawi and warned him, they might be after you too, watch out. Scotland Yard detectives were quick to realise the Alex Bakiri murder had been a professional job by a hitman who knew exactly what he was doing. They also quickly identified Bakiri's links to the Swedish underworld and was soon aware of the violence he had left behind in Malmo. Bakiri was described during the murder trial as having been a very big fish in organised crime, and he'd been suspected of international drug smuggling since 2007. Bakiri was obviously in fear of his life and was taking precautions on the night he died. He had asked his wife to go to the Colbert restaurant in Sloan Square first, take a photograph from the table and then send it to him. Only then would he enter. This is just across from Alex Bakiri's house uh, on Battersea Church Road. Um, and this is quite a, an important place in the story because um, just days before the shooting, uh, Anis Hemisi, who was the, uh, the gunman, 
uh, was came out in disguise. He was wearing a latex mask, but he was also wearing a council outfit and had a litter picker. Uh, he was going around picking up stuff, you know, picking up uh, bits of uh, litter, but he was, he was entering into this area, which is a, a private estate. And that is what uh, triggered the suspicion of a local resident who realised that council workmen don't, don't go onto the private estate. Uh, and when he looked closer, he probably noticed the, the latest mask. And he suddenly shouted out to him, what are, you know, what are you doing here? Who are you working for? Get away, get away from this estate. Hamisi returned later wearing a different disguise, darker clothes, a different latex mask, and a dark woolen hat, but the same sunglasses. The CCTV captured Hamisi walking past Bakiri's house on the 24th of December at 7 p.m. Two hours later, Bakiri was shot dead and Hamisi fled the crime scene as fast as he could. From door-to-door -door inquiries conducted over Christmas, it soon became clear the hitman had fled first on foot and then on a bicycle. This is the alley that Hamisi used uh, when he's running from the crime scene. It would have been pitch black uh, that time of night. Uh, he ran through here and let's go see where he picked up his bike. This is the, uh, the river path that runs all the way uh, down the side of the Thames, that's Battersea Bridge. And uh, he, would have picked, he picked the uh, bike up here. and hold up at an apartment in nearby Oyster Wharf. The owner of the apartment, a pensioner called Jeanette Dickinson, had rented it on Airbnb to a Swede called Esteban Pino Munizaga. After murder squad detectives identified her flat as being at the center of the crime, Mrs. Dickinson messaged Munizaga saying, I have to tell you that the police are looking for you in connection with a shooting in Battersea on Christmas Eve. Someone saw you going into flat 119. Of course, I hope you didn't do it. Get in touch if I can help, Jeanette. In fact, it wasn't Munizaga had been seen entering the flat after the murder. It was Anis Hamisi, a gunman hired by Amir Meki's gang back in Malmo. When the time came to give his own side of the story, Hamisi denied he was the man behind the mask. He claimed he'd been invited to London by a 22-year-old Arab girl called Nadine, who he'd met on Facebook. He said she let him stay at her friend's apartment and he hoped they would watch Netflix and chill for a few days. Hamisi claimed she never turned up and when he heard about the murder, he realized he'd been set up. But he was unable to prove her existence or show any messages he had exchanged with her when he was in London. Nor was he able to explain away CCTV footage from the hallway of Oyster Wharf, which showed the killer still wearing a latex mask, entering the apartment after the murder. And then a few hours later, Hamisi emerging from the same door. Two London men had been hired with the task of cleaning up the apartment and removing evidence. The pair removed and disposed of the murder weapon the mask and Hamisi's suitcase, but they failed to return and clean up the flat. One of them said he was high on heroin at the time and couldn't remember anything about the Christmas period. When the police identified the flat on the 27th of December, they found a partially torn up airplane ticket, which would lead them to Hamisi, whose DNA and fingerprints were also found in the apartment. Hamisi, Munizaga and two other Swedes, Tobias Andersson and Bauer Carrere, were extradited from Sweden to the UK and went on trial at Southwark Crown Court. Andersson had bought the litter picker and delivered it to the apartment and Bauer Carrere had handed over the bike to Hermisi. But they both gave evidence and said they'd been tricked or manipulated into their actions. In February 2022, Hermisi was convicted of murder Munizaga was found guilty of manslaughter, while Clifford Rollocks and Claude Caster were convicted of perverting the course of justice. Anderson and Bauer Carrere were both acquitted of all charges. 
Hamisi was jailed for life and told he would have to spend at least 35 years in jail. Judge Bobby Chima Grubb QC said he was a gun for hire and she described the killing of Bakiri as international crime at its most brutal. She told Hemisi, you carried out an audacious execution intended to induce terror in southwest London in those associated with Flama Bakiri. But not only in this city, the impact was felt thousands of miles away because his origins is in the battle between callous gangs who disregard borders to commit crime, including targeted killings. The affluent streets of Battersea have now returned to normal, but residents will not forget the bloody Christmas of 2019.